Good to see you this morning. Uh, my name's Colin, and we're glad to have uh, Dan Green with us. I have to avoid saying Dan Brown. Uh, or the Reverend Green, I was thinking, if you ever played Cluedo. Uh, no, it's good to have him with us. We're looking today at the subject of holiness, and one of the taglines that we had on the seminar title was, Without holiness, no one will see God. So we look forward to what Dan's going to bring to us. There'll be opportunity to interact with what he says and maybe to interact with each other as well. So great to have us here. Just to say that seminars for next year probably won't start until uh, later in the year. So we're not going to be running seminars in January, February, March, um, but we'll be starting later on and we'll give details about that primarily through email in due course. It's to give us a little bit of time to think about um, Solent Gospel Partnership, what our purpose is, how better we can achieve some of our aims, and there's possibilities that um, we might expand the region if that can work out, but um, those are some of the things that we want to talk about. Okay, so I'm gonna pray, and then I'm gonna hand over to Dan, and he can introduce himself if he wants to. Um, and thank you for coming along, Dan, and giving your time to us. Let's pray. Our Lord God and our Heavenly Father, we do thank you that you do not call us to some academic achievement in order to be acceptable to you, but you call us to humbly submit to yourself and to live a life that's dedicated to you and that's different, very different to others but is shaped by your character and is molded in your likeness. And we would ask, Lord, as we listen today and talk together and question, that you would indeed challenge us about the importance of living a life that honors your son and follows in his footsteps. And you know, Lord, that we find that uh, enormous challenge at times. There are big temptations and uh, lures, as it were, that would draw us away from a wholehearted devotion to yourself. And we'd ask, Lord, that you'd use this morning to help us progress in our holiness and in our devotion to you. And help Dan this morning, Lord. Thank you that he can be with us. Thank you for the time he's put in prior to this, Lord. May it bear fruit in uh, what he says and in our lives. And we ask this, please, in Jesus' name. Amen. Good. Do you want to hand some of them out? While well, Colin's handing out those handouts, and which will cover all the material that we'll be looking at this morning, just a quick um, introduction. Um, um, as you said, I'm Dan, I'm married to Kate, and we have three children, um, Molly, who is 20, Harrison, who's our middle adopted son, who's 11, almost 12, and Wesley, who is five. Um, I've been pastor at Banster Community Church for the last 10 years. I was assistant for two and a half years at the same church prior to that, and then before that, I worked for an Anglican church for 18 months in Eastbourne, and before that, I was out Kill for a couple of years. So that's me. I, I support Crystal Palace. Um, I'm from that part of the area. And um, that's probably the only other important um, bit of information worth, worth knowing. We're thinking about this, this topic of holiness today. And I think we want to say right at the start that holiness matters. It, it matters a lot. J.C. Ryle says we must be holy because this is the one grand end and purpose for which Christ came into the world. Jesus is a complete saviour. He does not merely take away the guilt of a believer's sin. He does more. He breaks its power. Holiness matters because we have been saved to be holy. Paul writes, Husbands are to love their wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. 
Earlier in the letter, he writes that Christians have been chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. Holiness matters because, as well as saving us because he loves us and for his glory, God has saved us to be holy. Holiness matters also because we are commanded to be holy. God's people are are called to be holy as God is holy. Peter writes, as obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance, but just as he who called you is holy, be holy in all that you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. And it is vital that we are. As that that tagline um, goes in, in this session, is without holiness, no one will see the Lord. So we are safe to be holy, we're commanded to be holy. But there's other reasons why holiness matters as well. Holiness is evidence of our salvation. God's word's clear that those whose lives are marked by habitual ungodliness will not go to heaven. Paul the Apostle Paul again, do you not know the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexual immoral, immoral nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, no, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. That offset quote, we are justified by faith alone, but the faith that justifies is never alone. Holiness is evidence of our salvation. That's another reason why it matters. It's also, it also matters because it's essential for our evangelism. So think about Peter's first letter. And and what is one of the the big focuses on that is on God's people who are strangers and exiles in this world living holy lives so that they stand out, so that they are marked as being different from the world around them. Because worldly Christians and a worldly church can never reach the world. But by being truly different, by living truly as aliens and strangers in this world, as citizens of heaven, we can make a difference. So just some, some, a selection of verses he, he, from his letter. 1 Peter 2, verses 11 and 12. Dear friends, I urge you, as aliens and strangers in the world, to abstain from sinful desires which war against your souls. Live such good lives among the pagans, that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. 1 Peter 3 verse 1, Wives, in the same way, be submissive to your husbands, so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behaviour of their wives. Or that, that, that verse that we always like to trot out every time we're trying to, to convince them, the church, that they need to be sharing the gospel. But in your heart, set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope you have. There's a, there's a real expectation in, in behind that verse that people will actually come up to believers in the Lord Jesus and ask them, about the hope they have. And why is that? Well, well, surely it's because of the way they are living, because they are living a life filled with hope. Holiness matters. But if holiness matters, we do need to be clear about what holiness is. Because when we talk about holiness, there is a danger. And it's this danger of describing what holiness is in terms of the values and standards of a particular generation or a particular class that we belong to. Michael Allen, a professor in the States, says, much has gone under the name of holiness has in fact been mere cultural preference. I don't know whether you've, how long you've been in churches, whether you've grown up in, in churches, whether you've been through Sunday school youth groups, and into the main church family. But that was very much my story. And I can remember as a teenager, um, really holiness being defined by four Ds. And as long as I got these four Ds right, everything's fine. Um, What what, what, what do you think those those four Ds were? 
Anyone want to have a guess? No? <laughs> Drinks, yeah. So as long as I didn't drink alcohol, that's, that's okay. Don't, don't dance, yeah. Um, barn dances were okay. The church um, held them. But, but don't go to, to a nightclub, that, those dens of Im- immorality, because that'll end up going into all other areas. Drugs. Drugs, yep, yeah, the illegal um, ones. And, and yeah, I don't want to say no to all, all drugs. I've, paracetamol's fine. Um, in moderation, that is. Um, um, what, what, what would you think a final D was? And this was particularly aimed at the, the girls in the youth group. Dress, yeah. Make sure you... Um, yeah. and no, do, do, do dress, but do dress rightly, yeah. So, so, and it's like those, those were the key things because all of them, and the reason why those were were focused on because where each of them might lead to, drink too much, well, that might lead to sex. Take drugs, be off your face, because that might lead to sex. Dress, dress in modestly, that might lead to sex. Go to a nightclub and, and dance, because that, might, it was, that was it. But the whole teaching of holiness was limited to the fear. So what is holiness? We need to be clear on what holiness is. Well, when we talk about holiness, it, it, we've got to be clear that it is God who defines what holiness is. The Bible tells us that God is holy. Isaiah 6, verses 1 to 3, In a year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and a train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces. With two they covered their feet. And with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. God is holy. Is he who defines what holiness is. And the general consensus, the broad agreement of when we try and define what holiness is, and mostly it's given this um, definition of, will involve something like separateness or um, consecration or distinction. When, when something is holy, it is set apart, it is separate from something else. And this separateness is, is put in two ways. It's sometimes talked of in a, in a sort of majestic or metaphysical separateness. So that would be kind you get in like 1 Samuel 2, 2. There is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one beside you. There is no rock like our God. Or what we saw in Isaiah, he's high and exalted. God is high and exalted. He is the one who is exalted above all creation. He's distinct from all that he has made. So holiness is spoken in terms of this majestic metaphysical separateness. But then it's also spoken of in terms of a moral separateness. This is a message we have heard and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. God is pure, perfect, without fault or blemish. He is righteous, absolutely. And and those verses in Isaiah really capture those two aspects of this sort of majestic side of holiness and this moral side of holiness. You have right at the start Isaiah looking up and seeing the Lord high and exalted. He's majestic above all things. He is separate from what he has made. But then you have this moral side as, as Isaiah, overwhelmed by who God is, says, woe is me, realising his impurity, his uncleanness, as he sees the King, the Lord Almighty. God is holy in that he's morally pure, he's separate from sin, he he loves righteousness, he hates all evil, he is majestic, high and exalted. Now, without denying these ways of defining holiness, I think that, and in fact I'd say I'm persuaded that Sinclair Ferguson is onto something where where he actually says we, we want to actually go a bit, push it a bit further. We want to press this language of holiness beyond the, the language of separateness. I don't know if you've um, read his book, Devoted to, to God. If you're going to read one book on holiness, that would be my recommendation. It is outstanding. But, but he writes, talking about holiness, he says, 
For anything to be true of God as he is in himself, it must also be true apart from his work of creation. What he's getting at is saying, when we talk about God being holy, our general definitions is always about how God is, is holy in terms of how he relates to creation. So we talk about God's holiness in, in sort of majestic terms because he's high and exalted compared to what he has made. And God is perfectly pure. He's morally separate from creation because we are sinful, we are unrighteous. And what Ferguson's arguing is he's saying, look, actually that is true. The separateness does exist when we compare God to his works. But he actually says if God is holy and defines who holiness is, and what it, when we talk about holiness, it has to be true of God in himself, in his triune existence. He says it must be true of God simply as he always existed as the eternal trinity. And from this viewpoint, God's holiness could, cannot fully be understood as separateness, since the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit are not separate from each other. He'll say distinct, as in persons, yeah, Father is not the Son or the Spirit, and, and so on. But separate in the sense of being placed at a distance from one another, but, well, that's, that's not true. That can't be true. So this leads him to conclude that holiness, he would define as... By that, he says, we mean the perfectly pure devotion of each of the three persons to the other two. Absolute, permanent, exclusive, pure, irreversible, fully expressed devotion. And this devotion obviously will create a moral separate. No, same, but moral is in a sense that they will be separate from sin. Within the Trinity, there is no sin. But we may wonder, well, how does this square with this idea of this majestic separateness? Well, here's how, how Ferguson deals with this. And again, I'll put it out there. You can d decide whether you agree with him on, or not. He says, going back to Isaiah 6, he explains that holiness is the intensity of the love that flows within the very being of God among and between each of the three persons of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And it is this sheer intensity of this devotion between the persons of a Godhead that calls the seraphim, whose holiness is perfect but creaturely, to veil their faces. So, so what he's saying is that the, this eternal devotedness of the persons of a Trinity to each other is of such an intensity that it causes this separation between God and his creation. He says, to gaze on the sheer intensity of this flow of triune holy love would be to endanger themselves. They must distance themselves, cover their faces, and be separate. So the point is that not that holiness does not involve separation, but this separation is created or flows out of a devotion to God. The Father's devoted to the Son and the Spirit. The Son's devoted to the Father and the Spirit. The Spirit is devoted to the Father and the Son. God is holy. So to be holy is to be devoted to God as God is. I'll leave that out there. You can decide whether you're persuaded by Ferguson's argument. I think it's fairly compelling, personally. Now, I'll give you a chance to, to come back if, if you want to. But let's just move very briefly on from the holy God, this God who is devoted to, to God as he is to himself, to a holy life. So if we were to take this definition of to be holy is to be devoted to God as God is, what does a holy life look like? Well, it's to be devoted to God. And God has, has shown us this. And our example is, of course, the Lord Jesus. As the image of the invisible God, the true image of God, Jesus, the incarnate Son's earthly life, exemplified the same devotion to his Father he has shown for all eternity. In John 4, 34, Jesus says, My food is to do the will of him who sent me, 
and to finish his work. Devoted. John 12, 49, For I did not speak of my own accord, but a Father who sent me commanded me what to say and how to say it. Devoted to God. So a holy life is to, to follow in Jesus' footsteps. Jonathan Edwards, I think, just captures this devotion well in his diary. One of the entries goes like this. He, say, he writes, I have been before God and have given myself all that I am and have to God, so that I am not, in any respect, my own. Neither have I, no, neither have I any right to this body or any of its members, no right to this tongue, these hands, these feet, no right to these senses, these eyes, these ears, this smell or this taste. I have given myself clear away and have not retained anything as my own. I have been this morning to him and told him that I gave myself wholly to him. Devotion to God. Seeking to follow the example of the Lord Jesus who was devoted to his Father. Let me just pause for a moment. Does, does anyone want to come back, on, come back on that before we actually start to think about what a, a holy life looks like, practically what this devotion might look like in, in reality? Not today. I'll leave. If, that, if, if it's just, it's just not t- time within the, the realm. I think I, I, in a way, I'm, I'm affirming in my own mind what you've been saying um, in the form of devotion. And um, when God separates us, um, He is making us holy. It's the first step. And if we separate anything, um, in a sense, we are saying, I'm devoting that. Yeah, no, I, I think it very much fits. I think this is why I'm, I'm, I'm persuaded by it, because when you just... I think if, what, what's been new to me is actually just talking this language. So I think the, under, the principle behind what is being said, I think is, I've sort of naturally assumed, but he's actually sort of put it in more concrete terms and say, OK, this idea of devotedness, well, that's, um, that does seem to, to be setting something aside for the particular purpose, um, is you're devoting something to it. I just hadn't really come across it being spoken of in that, that, that language. He's dwelling on the Trinitarian aspect of it before moving on. Yeah. How, how, that, how that impacts us and, and, a, and a covenantal yeah. look at that. So before we cut into Jesus, we're just, as it were, dw- we're, we're dwelling on the Trinitarian relationship, which I think is really helpful. Yeah, and I, th- and I think this, this, is, this is actually... It, it comes into play in lots of other areas. Like, if you've been following um, um, the sort of big debate over the last couple of years on the sort of ha- like relationship between the, the Son and the Father in the God, like this, um, is there an eternal submission of the Son to, to the Father, and particularly how that's flown out of the sort of gender relationships? Now, one of the big debates, the issues with that is, is this discussion of um, God in his in his triune existence, apart from his works of creation. So I think what Sinclair Ferguson is doing there, is, which is helpful, is actually saying, before we come at God's relationship to creation, let's look at God's relationship in him, himself. And I think probably a lot of problems that are, or debates that are happening are coming as we're, we're just approaching it from God relating to creation rather than um, the sort of classical... Um, theology of looking at God in, in himself. So I, 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 I find it particularly, um, what he's saying here, um, helpful. Um, but I, if you want to know more, read um, Devoted to God. He spends a whole chapter um, really putting out this, 
in thesis. That was the first time I've really come across it being spoken of in that language, and I found it fairly um, pretty helpful. So uh, let me commend that book to you. Okay, let's, let's think about what a, what a holy life looks like. What does a, a life of devotion to God look like practically? I, I think we can, we can just describe it in different ways. I've given you, given you five, I think, different angles we can look at it from. There's probably other ones we can, can go to. And what does the being devoted to God look like? Well, it looks like putting to death sin in our lives. That's being devoted to God means putting to death sin. It's doing what Paul calls us to do in, in Romans 6, verses 12 and 13, where he writes, Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body, so that you obey its desires. Do not offer parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourself to God. As those who have been brought from death to life, offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness. It's putting to death sin. It's offering our bodies to, to God. Another, looking at it another angle, we're seeking to obey Jesus' commands. And being devoted means obeying the Lord Jesus. If anyone loves him, they will obey his teaching. In the Great Commission, words that we, we're so familiar with, we are to be teaching people to obey everything Jesus has commanded. So we can actually say that the Great Commission is about holiness. That, 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 that's, that's what the Great Commission is about. It's about seeing people live a holy life, a life of devotion to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It is to, to, to live with, um, to be those that have the name um, of God placed upon him. The Great Commission is about holiness. It, it looks like him being different from the world. That's what being holy will, will mean, being devoted to God will mean. It will be with the world being all that opposes the will of God. Kevin DeYoung um, says, it, says it, but I don't think it was him who said this, this phrase first, but I think it's really helpful. He says, worldliness is whatever makes sin look normal and righteousness look strange. And, and, and it's going against that. We're not to, it's being different from that. We're, we're, to, we're to live in, in such a way that, that, that makes sin look abnormal and righteousness looks normal. That's what the church should be a place where sin actually should stand out and, and be repulsed, whereas obedience to, to God should look normal. Holy, what does devotion to God look like? Well, it looks like followers of the Lord Jesus becoming more human as God's image is restored in us. I, th I think we, we've, we've, we've seen it, but um, there is a sense in which as people get more and more rooted in sin, they become less human. And in fact, we, we can sometimes talk about people um, behaving like animals, um, not because they actually are animals, but because sin has taken such a um, hold upon them that they are less reflecting of God's image as they should be. They're becoming less human, whereas when someone is converted and God's image is being restored in them, they're becoming more human and, and more like Christ, who is the true image of God. And becoming, being devoted to God, above all, is becoming more like the Lord Jesus, which is the purpose of of salvation. So Romans 8, 28 and 29, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be a firstborn among many brothers. Being devoted to God means becoming more like Christ. And we can talk about becoming like Christ in, in different areas. So we, we might want to talk about becoming like Christ in terms of our affections. Becoming like Christ means loving what Christ likes and hating what Christ hates. We, we might talk about becoming like Christ in terms of our desires and seeking, the, seeking those things that Christ would seek. And you can just go to to the Bible and just do a, a survey of what things does God seek? What things is God looking after? What things does he desire? And then, then that's, that's telling you what becoming like Christ would be like. You're saying with what he loves and hates. 
We can talk about becoming like Christ in terms of our will. That is, we choose what Christ would choose and reject what Christ would reject. We can talk about and becoming like Christ in terms of our thoughts. As those who have the mind of Christ, we now think the same thoughts after him. And in terms of our emotions, we, we feel what Christ would feel. And I, and I think we, we probably do that as well. And naturally, in, hopefully in terms of our, our ministry, when we, particularly when we're talking about the lost, we, we may go to the, those passages where, where the Lord Jesus looks on upon lost people and, and the pity he feels in the heart, his heart, the compassion he feels. And we may, we'll, we'll say to our folk, that's how we should feel about the thousands of people we are coming into contact daily. That they are lost and, and perishing. We should love them with the love that Christ has for them. So that's what a, a holy life um, looks like. What being devoted to Christ, to God, looks like. But just to, to, to double back, is we, we, we then need to ask this question of how then do we become holy? We've been talking about what holiness is and what a holy life is looked like. And how, how do we actually get this, this holy life? And this is where the, the language of sanctification comes in or, or getting holiness. To sanctify, you can simply define as to, to, to make holy. And, and this is something that, that, that God, is, God has done, is doing, and will do for his people, for those who repent and believe. We're, we're to talk about sanctification in a, a past, present, and, and future sense. Holiness is something that all believers have, have got. In Christ, we are sanctified. We are already holy. This is sometimes referred to as positional or definitive sanctification. And, it's, and this, this sanctification in this terms is spoken of um, all over the place in the, in the New Testament. So Acts 20, verses, verse 32, Paul saying to the elders at Ephesus, Now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Past. It's already happened. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 11, and this is what some of you were, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus by the Spirit of God. It's, it's what's happened in the past. Hebrews 10, 10, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So there is this definitive, definite, once for all sense in which we have been sanctified. God has made his people holy. In the gospel, he shares his holiness with them in Christ. So holiness is something we've got. Holiness is also something we are getting. And, and I guess this is probably the, 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 the sense in which we often will use the language of sanctification. We, when we're talking about sanctification, we're talking about progressive sanctification, growing in holiness as we strive to live holy lives. It, it's just what we're finding in 2 Corinthians 3.18. We with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his likeness with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. This, this idea of, yes, we are holy, but we are getting holy. We are growing in holiness as we become more like Christ. And then there's a, a perfected sanctification, a future sense in that this growth in holiness, this progress in sanctification continues throughout our lives until the moment our sanctification is perfected when we see Jesus face to face. 1 John 3 verse 2, Dear friends, now we are children of God and what we will be has not yet been known but we know that when he appears we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. Yes, making someone holy is a work God has done, but it's a work that he continues to do. God is making us, his people, holy. Or to put it crudely, holy and holiness is something we've got and holiness is something we are getting. But in terms of how we, we get holiness, how, how does that happen? How, how are we made holy? How do we grow in holiness? 
Well, this has been something that I guess uh, probably three or four years ago um, became a, 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 a hot topic of debate. You may, you may be familiar with it, you may, you may not be. There's a, there was a, a discussion that revolved around, I guess, what you could probably define as a, a silver bullet approach to sanctification versus uh, the more traditional orthodox approach. So in terms of this silver bullet approach, um, it all came out of, I suppose, the most prominent person who put forward this view was a guy called Tullian Chavidium. Um, um, the most easiest way of saying it is he's Billy Graham's grandson. Um, he was a pastor in, in, in Florida, um, now disqualified Presbyterian pastor, um, although he's just come back into ministry leading a, a church called The Sanctuary. And, and he put forward this, this view, which, which became part of what was known as the Liberate Movement. Which, and he basically said, all you need to do to be made holy is to look back and believe in your justification. That's it. He said, it's just about looking back and believing your justification. I've put on your handout a few quotes from his book, Jesus plus nothing equals everything. And, and, and he basically, which captures this sort of idea of just looking back and believing your justification. So he, he writes, sanctification is the daily hard work of going back to the reality of our justification is going back to the certainty of our objectively secured pardon in Christ and hitting the refresh button a thousand times a day. Or later on he says, growth in the Christian life is a process of receiving Christ, it is finished, into, a, into new, deeper parts of being, our being every day. And it happens as the Holy Spirit daily carries God's good word of justification into our regions of unbelief what one writer calls our unevangelized territories. Or again, so by all means, work, but the hard work is not what you think, your personal improvement and moral progress. The hard work is washing your hands of you and resting in Christ's finished work for you, which will inevitably produce personal improvement and moral progress. So, so basically what he's saying is, for God to make us, ha- for God to make us holy, all that needs to happen, all that we need to do is look to Christ and believe that we are justified in him. And, and that, that view got, got um, a lot of prominence on, on the internet. Um, this, this liberate movement came out of it. I think my, my one question I just want to, to say a few years on from it with the debate subsided is, look at how that worked out for him. He went down this view of this is how I'm made holy and it led to him having adulterous affairs, being disqualified from ministry. Um, did, it, did it make him, him holy? And it's worth saying that this approach actually goes against uh, the traditional orthodox understanding that sanctification happens when by God's enabling grace we are able to more and more to die unto sin and live unto righteousness as the Westminster Shorter Catechism puts it. One of the things that was helpful that because of this debate is that there have been, in recent last few years, um, several helpful books pitched at a popular level being published on it. We're probably all familiar with Kevin DeYoung's A Hole in Our Holiness, and David Paulison's written one called um, How Sanctification Works, which I'm just going to say is incredibly overpriced for a book that's basically a blog post. It's, it's, it's under 100 pages. It costs you a lot of money, and it can be summarised in about 500 words. Um, but it's, it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't um, negate that it. it's a good, good book. It's just... It does apply to a lot of books. It does apply to, <laughs> to, to a lot of books. And what, what's actually interesting is, is both of these, these books... Um, what they do is they challenge this silver bullet, bullet approach, but they don't actually disagree fully with what, um, I'll say, Billy and Graham's grandson is, is saying, that, it, that is, we are sanctified by remembering our justification. But they just say, that, that is true, but is it always a crucial ingredient in how we are progressively changed and sanctified? 
Pallison writes, a vast Bible, centuries of pastoral experience, and innumerable testimonies bear joint witness that there is a lot more to it. His, 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 his thesis is that actually people are changed into Christ's image through an interplay of, of five different factors. He says sometimes it's the direct intervention of God. So God just supernaturally works on a person and, and changes them. It just, just overnight, um, new desires, new attitudes, new life just uh, are, are created in a person. And, and, and maybe some of us will have testimony of how a change just happened and we just don't know how it, it just came by. It, it was literally one minute you were like this, the next minute we weren't. This direct intervention with God. Other times it's the words of Scripture. And, and I'll pick up on this in a little bit later, but and this is a point, and there's a really helpful section in, in The Hole in Our Holiness where Kevin Young sort of describes Jesus as this great physician and having lots of um, remedies for different people's um, 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 areas of struggle or illnesses or weakness or, or failings. And there's different words of Scripture that will apply to different people at different times and different circumstances that can bring about change in them. Sometimes it happens through the, the wisdom of other people. So you spend time um, discussing with other believers um, an issue, a problem, and, and you find the, advice, the godly advice they give. It could be directly they're applying scriptural teaching or using sanctified common sense. And, and what they share actually helps you to, to change, to live a more godly life. Sometimes it's circumstances of life, like God's disciplining of us and bringing illness or suffering or hardships, trials into our lives to, to, to bring about change, to teach us. And lastly, the, the active participation of the individual in the change. The person actually wants to, to live a more holy life, to put some effort into it. So there's, there's no good reason to, to think that there is a, a singular um, sanctifying silver bullet and the, the teaching of Scripture is, is far more complex, far more broader than look to Christ and believe your justification. Does anyone have any questions, comments they want to, to come back on? There, I, I think this is a good point to, to probably take a, take a break before we get into the, the next amount of material. Does anyone want any pushback? Questions? I, th I, th I think pr probably it's, um, I think there was two things, I th probably that was deep behind the, the movement. I think there was one, uh, um, maybe over-legalistic teaching in, in, in the church. So I think there was, there was a there was reaction to a very harsh um, um, legalism that was that is, that's present in, in, in the church and it's probably equally as true in, this, in some churches in this country, but obviously in America, just being that much bigger than, than the UK with so many more churches, and there, there, there probably is a very harsh, like maybe how some of the sort of fundamentalist um, movement there. So I think there's a reaction to that. I think, I think also there's, there's probably, um, there's also, I think, well, I was going back to what I was saying at the start, this idea of cultural preference, so I think some of the time it was maybe um, people were being taught things were to be holy, you need to do this. Whereas actually what they were being asked to wasn't actually um, necessarily scriptural. It was more just reflection of uh, the cultural norms of that place that, they, that maybe a traditionalist wanted to ensure was, was kept. And again, I think we can we probably see some of the pushback even in between sort of a, a younger generation in this country and, and an older generation, even between maybe more of the um, stricter churches and, and the, the more open evangelicals now. Like, just even in terms of things like dress, like there, there'll be still plenty of this idea of um, when you go to, to gather with God's people on a Sunday, you have to wear a shirt and tie and a, a suit if, you, if you're going to be holy. And to turn up in jeans, well... But you, you, can't, you can't do... So there's some cultural um, 
things. Like even, like even in the church I pastor, we'll see some of the older folk in the church will still come um, in a suit and tie, even though we've got a fairly um, casual, it's casual in terms of dress code in, in the church, because that's what they've done for their whole Christian, Christian life. Um, it's not necessarily one's right one, but I don't, it's, holy, like, it's, it's whether you can define holiness by what you wear on, on, a, on a Sunday, and I think there was probably some pushback um, from there. I think even in areas like um, things such as um, um, what, what you're allowed to, kind of TV programs you're allowed to, to watch. Is, like you, you read some of the, um, the, the, the books and things that were written around the time of sort of Puritans. And what, what you're allowed to is very, there's, there's a real strictness, which I think there was some, um, some rejection of that as well. So I think that's probably was in the background, a younger generation coming up and sort of throwing off some of um, the cultural shackles of the generation above, but also, um, which probably sometimes disrespectfully, and um, they should have been maybe a bit more, but I think the, the right, the sort of legalism that was present as well. So I think that's what's probably going on there. Yeah, so, yeah. I was reading only a day or two ago, I forgot the way, I'm forgetting everything. But that God, it, it was in relation to um, loss of memory and that kind of thing, happens in old people, dementia. And they were saying, um, but the wonderful thing is that God is at work within you. So he is still at work mm. in the people who don't appear to be responsive. Uh, and in some way, he is working towards their holiness. Uh, that's just a thought, but it's comforting thought to me that God works in us right to the end. Yeah, I, I, think, I think we want to, we, we want to believe that. Like Philippians 1 verse 6, um, he who began a good work in you will bring it to, to completion. And, and I think we, what we want to be saying to people, while they are still, believers, while they are still alive, even in however weak a condition they're in, and God is still a work in them. He hasn't got them to the place he wants them at the, the moment when they see that the Lord Jesus, that uh, sanctification is ongoing progressively for the entirety of, of life to the moment we take our, our final breath. And, and I think, again, I think you're right, amongst the older folk, like one of the things we do in our church is you know, we do have quite a strong care home ministry. We're, over a course of a month, doing services in about eight different care homes. And those who take services will look out and think, is anything really going, going on? Um, but some of the testimonies of those who go in and visit is that they discover, some, to their surprise, people in, in their 90s who maybe not a lot um, really seems to be there anymore, suddenly coming out with a gem. Or um, often there's a case, hymn, lyrics of, or words of hymns that they learnt 70 years ago are quoted um, and said with, with simple faith, which is yeah, wonderful to hear. Yep. Yeah, I was going to pick up on this other one about um, the, the Tullian thing. And, uh, is it Luther who's got the image of the drunk man on the horse that we're always going to fall off one way or the other? Yeah, Damien is, yeah. And it, it's, a, it's an interesting thing that any time you try and tell somebody a rule, you're accused of being a legalist. And, um, and I, it's just so bizarre, isn't it, when the Bible's full of rules? Yeah. You know, Ephesians doesn't stop at the end of chapter 3. And, um, even even like the Ten Commandments, it starts, I'm the Lord your God, he brought you out of slavery, out of the land of Egypt. Yeah. We can stop that. <laughs> it then gives you ten things to do, um, and, or not do. And, um, yeah, but for, for us, I suppose, then, how do we, how do you think we can properly be teaching rules to our people without it sounding like legalism? I'm going to say that to, to, to come back, come back with me a question because I, I think I want to just get through the next before we, we come to that. So that will just at least set, set up some of the way. Yeah. I, I'm just wondering about the Talent religion. Is that, you know, he's, like, so he's reacting probably against a sort of legalism, which sort I of mentioned, but it's, it's sort of interesting because he's sort of, he's probably wanting in his head to sort of think, no, no, sacrifices, but what God does, not by, because it's supposed to often be a bit more sacrifices to me. Working to be better, so the sort of like the sort of 
the shortcut, the wrong answer that people often have in their head. So he wants to probably think sanctification is God's work shaping you. But instead of using the sort of traditional means, you know, the, the, the sort of mortification, the yeah. mortification sort of categories that are there in the Westminster Confession, Catechism, you know, dying to sin, living unto righteousness, and, and that sort of two pronged rhythm of sanctification as it works out in our yeah. lives, um, he sort of changes it to sort of like a, he changes the means of sanctification to sort of a therapeutic sort of approach, you know, sort yeah. of saying, you know, you know like, um, um, know who you are, how self-actualization, self-realization of who you are, and um, you know, don't seek to grow in holiness. Just remember who you are as a holy person, and that will somehow trickle down. I've heard that before in the past in British evangelicalism. Y- yeah, so, so yeah, I, yeah. Sort of, um, folk that would be quite wary about the third use of the law stuff. Um, would often say you know, it's about recognizing your identity and living in that identity, live in your identity, which is, I mean, to be probably is more crude than that, in a sort of, sort of more simplistic way rather. But it's that sort of thinking that is maybe not the most helpful way to think about all the other things. Instead of sort of chucking out the traditional means of sanctification that God uses and replacing them with a sort of self actualization therapeutic approach. Yeah, we're going to come back. That's, 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 that's what we're going to come on to, actually. That's, that's really the, the, the focus of, I think, what I'm doing the second section, looking at. Yeah, I think right, it's, it's, um, it's, 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 it's this age old game, the balance right of um, God works, we work. How, how, how's, how's that dynamic um, going into place? I think you're, when you talk about the sort of therapeutic self, that very much fits particularly with uh, the sort of American um, culture at, at the moment, as, as well as sort of really ties. In, in with that. I think probably one, one other thing that might um, is also, I think, playing into the background is there, is there does seem to be that there's a lot of people, certainly like you're coming across in, in the States, is uh, what you say a lot of people who have sort of um, been hurt by the church. Like that, that's sort of the language, like they use language of being survivors of different movements. And so it does fit. It all, his whole ministry does sort of fit in that people have come out of the sort of traditional um, orthodox, conservative evangelical churches, just found it a bit too um, like hard work or it was too strict in terms of rules and we're now a sort of sanctuary where you can sort of be, be who you are and it's all right because God, God loves you apart from all your failings. And, 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 and again, I think this is where Paulison and, and Dion, to be fair to him, actually say, look, we're not dismissing this idea of look back and, you're just, and believe your justification. It doesn't have a sanctifying... There is, some, there is a truth in there. The problem has come is when you've made that all the truth and you've sort of thrown, thrown out... Yeah, the baby... Negatives but, and imperatives, yeah. isn't it? And we tend to... We tend to legalism cuts to the imperatives without remembering the indicatives and yeah. cheap grace yeah. theology dwells on the indicatives but forgets the imperatives mm. and, and scripture does both it, it gives you imperatives on the back of the indicatives hence Ephesians 1 to 3 is followed by um, whatever it is 4 to 6 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> good let me pray and then 11 o'clock, so have a break. Let's pray. Oh God, we thank you that in your gracious plan of salvation, it was your design that we, who you have saved through faith in the Lord Jesus, through his finished work on the cross, would be made holy, would be set apart to be yours, to be devoted to you and to live lives of devotion. Lord, we pray that um, in our own minds we would get particularly the balance right in terms of um, what it is that you do and what it is that we are responsible for doing. Lord, we thank you that ultimately everything we do is because of your grace and because of we are being energised by your grace. Lord, as we um, look in the second section of how we um, practically go about growing in holiness, We pray that we would be those that um, get the right balance of um, 
reliance upon your work in our lives, but also as you call us to do, working out our salvation with trembling and fear. Lord, bless our conversations now over this um, short break, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.